Good evening, everyone. I'm Alan Price, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. And on behalf of all my library and foundation colleagues, I thank you for braving the weather to join us this evening. I would like to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters for the Kennedy Library Forum's lead sponsor, Bank of America and the Lowell Institute, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe, Xfinity, and WBUR. I'm also delighted to welcome all of you who are watching tonight's program online. Akhil Lamar and Eric Foner have kindly agreed to sign copies of their most recent books after tonight's program. Our bookstore will be selling copies if you are interested. We thank you all for silencing your cell phones. I have to say, you've done a great job all season. Let's keep it going. We are so pleased to have this timely opportunity to explore constitutional questions in depth this evening. In light of the current discussions on constitutional issues occurring at the federal level, I'm now delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. Akhil Reed Amar is Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University, where he teaches constitutional law in both Yale College and Yale Law School. His work has won awards from both the American Bar Association and the Federalist Society, and he has been cited by Supreme Court justices across the spectrum in more than three dozen cases, tops in his generation. He regularly testifies before Congress at the invitation of both parties. He has written widely for national publications and served as an informal consultant to the TV show, The West Wing. And his constitutional scholarship has been showcased on a wide range of national broadcasts. He is the author of dozens of law review articles and several books. Eric Foner, DeWitt Clinton Professor Emeritus of History at Columbia University, is one of this country's most prominent historians. He is one of only two persons to serve as president of the three major professional organizations, the Organization of American Historians, American Historical Association, and Society of American Historians, and one of a handful to have won the Bancroft and Pulitzer Prizes in the same year. Professor Foner's publications have concentrated on the intersections of intellectual, political, and social history, and the history of American race relations. His most recent book is The Second Founding, How the Civil War and Reconstruction Remade the Constitution. I'm also pleased to welcome back and introduce our moderator for this evening. Kenneth Mack is the inaugural Lawrence D. Beale Professor of Law and Affiliate Professor of History at Harvard University. His research and teaching have focused on American legal and constitutional history with a particular emphasis on race relations, politics, and economic life. He is the author of Representing the Race, the Creation of the Civil Rights Lawyer and co-editor of The New Black, What Has Changed and What Has Not with Race in America. He is currently working on a book that examines the social and political history of race and political economy in the United States since 1975. Please join me in welcoming our special guests. Well, um, first, uh, thank you to uh, Director Price and to the Kennedy Library for inviting me back here again. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with uh, such illustrious company. Uh, I'm going to start by asking each of our guests to talk about their recently published books, uh, which, as Director Price told you, they're, they're going to be signing afterwards. Um, the Second Founding by Eric Foner and The Constitution Today by Professor Akia Lamar. Um, so I, I want to start with, with Eric. Um, just explain a bit about what we should take from your book, The Second Founding. Mm -hmm. You cite a number of achievements uh, of the second founding, birthright citizenship, equal protection of laws, the right to vote, a reorientation of the, of the relationship between the federal government and the states. And you even have this sort of wonderful story about, you know, once Congress understands it's going to undo the three-fifths compromise, with emancipation, and of course there's over-representation because you know, if, if African Americans don't vote, we've got this problem. Um, so 
you know, you've got all of this, this wonderful detail about the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments, um, but what does this history tell us uh, that the larger reading public needs to know now? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, taking part in this and, um, and to the Kennedy uh, Library for having us. Um, you know, I am, unlike my two colleagues here, I am not a law professor, I'm not a lawyer, I've almost never been in a courtroom, very law-abiding person. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so um, I, I come at it maybe from a slightly different angle. I'm a little intimidated um, about uh, constitutional issues here, but on the other hand, uh, the takeaways, I guess, that I want for my book are, are just, a, let's say, three to begin with. One is what you mentioned already, that the issues, the, the key issues of the Reconstruction era right after the Civil War, which led to the rewriting of the Constitution through the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, are still on our agenda today. It's hard with these lights to see exactly who's in the audience and what ages you are, but at least some of you will understand when I say that these questions are on the front pages of our newspapers. <laughs> um, and who is a citizen? Who should be an American citizen? That's being fought out on our borders every day. Who should have the right to vote? What, how can, what is to stop states from denying large numbers of people the right to vote? That is being, the voter suppression is happening in many states as we, as we speak. Um, terrorism, how should we be dealing with terrorism? This was an era of considerable terrorism, not from abroad, but good homegrown American terrorism, the Ku Klux Klan and groups like that. Uh, white nationalists, violent white nationalists were uh, you know, very prominent in this period. So in other words, I, I think that to understand where we are today, one needs to know something about that period 150 years ago. But the second point is simply to, that you know, ev everyone knows, I guess, we, who has any education, that there were <laughs> amendments to the Constitution, but these three amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, do not occupy the same sort of place in our public consciousness as, let us say, the Bill of Rights or other parts of the Constitution. The people who wrote them are hardly household names, John Bingham, uh, James Ashley, Henry Wilson, uh, they're not known like uh, Madison and Hamilton. Of course, they didn't have a hip hop musical about them. But, um, you know, but I, we need to know about what happened because the, these amendments really, in my opinion, transformed the Constitution, really created a, the Constitution we live under today. And too often, I think, uh, the Supreme Court, or at least some people on it and others, kind of ignore those amendments when they're trying to talk about, let us say, the federal system. They go back to 1787 as if nothing changed in the Constitution as a result of the, um, uh, of the Civil War. So, um, you know, I, I just think that we need, people need to know more about how the Constitution was changed. And the final point is simply one of the sad lessons of this is that, uh, you know, rights in the Constitution are not self-enforcing and rights can be gained as they were, but rights can also be taken away as they also were in the late 19th, early 20th century. So that, we, uh, you know, under a conservative Supreme Court, uh, many things that we take for granted may not actually be as secure as we think. And this history is a sad example of, of that fact. Actually, I, I want to jump in just in that, that exact point and ask Professor Amar a question before we get to your your book. Um, you've sort of done something along the same lines, you know, the originalist jurisprudence ignoring um, the changes in the constitutional structure wrought by the, particularly the 14th Amendment. Um, can you, you know, in some measure, you're, you've tried to revive interest in these amendments as well. Can, yeah. can you talk a bit about that? Uh, thank you, and it's such an honor to be here, and it's a perfect segue, because what I, the first thing I wanted to tell everyone is, what an honor it is to be with one of my heroes, Eric Foner. <laughs> Thank you, Akil. Um, and the, the work that you alluded to is inspired by Eric Foner. Um, and I wrote a book a long time ago um, called The Bill of Rights, Creation and Reconstruction. And one of the proudest moments of my life was when Eric agreed to blurb the book. Um, <laughs> and here's, because um, uh, here's what the book is about. And it's captured by the title. First of all, it doesn't call itself the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments. When you look in your copy, it doesn't say that. 
why do we call it the Bill of Rights? And the answer, and the Supreme Court never not once referred to it as the Bill of Rights before the 1860s. And now that's what everyone calls it because the framers of the 14th Amendment, because a man named John Bingham, whom we just mentioned, kept referring to it as the Bill of Rights. So um, what's creation reconstruction? Well, the idea is that, that the structure of that book was part one, part two, and you might think of it, here's an analogy, um, if you're um, a Christian, Old Testament, New Testament. <laughs> okay, there's the Old Testament and it says a certain thing and then actually you've got a new set of texts that has to, um, uh, um, uh, uh, that obliges you to reinterpret in certain ways what the earlier texts say. So there's creation, Old Testament, then there's reconstruction, a second founding, if you will, a new birth of freedom, a reconstruction, a reconstitution, um, if um, you will. So if you're a Christian, you read the book of Isaiah, which says that a young woman shall give birth through the life and death and ministry and resurrection of Jesus, and you read it as if it says, um, a virgin shall give birth, or you read the Ten Commandments as if there's an eleventh like unto them, or you read, the, interpret the personality of God, Yahweh, um, through the prism of um, this reformist rabbi who says, actually, it's sort of Abba, Father. So um, we, as Americans, here's what we don't have in common. We don't have race in common. We don't have religion in common. We are many religions. We are many different language groups. Our forebears if, uh, came to the new world at very different times in very different ways from the Native American experience to the slave experience to the immigrant experience. That's my parents. That's why I was pointing to my own uh, chest. So we don't have race in common. We don't have religion in common. We don't have that ethnicity in common. We don't even have language in common. What we have in common is a narrative, a certain story. We are all Americans. And Eric had persuaded me by his work that I am not just a child of the founding fathers of, of Washington and uh, Hamilton and, and, and yes, Jefferson too, that's more complicated, but also of Lincoln. Um, that's who we are as Americans and Lincoln and his generation have to be given, uh, have to be um, uh, uh, thought of pretty much at the same level as the second founding as um, Washington and Hamilton. And, and that's, um, yes, that is my work, and I just have to tell you all, I'm getting it all from Eric Foner. <laughs> this he said it first. This is an exaggeration, folks. <laughs> <laughs> you came first. <laughs> okay. Um, so, okay, so let me uh, ask you a follow-up question yeah. about, about your book, uh, Akil. In your book, um, Constitution Today, you describe yourself as a constitutional journalist. Yes. Um, and in some measure, you're a, in this book, you gather lots of things that you've written before, you rework them um, into a whole. Um, and I'm going to ask sort of the same question I asked Eric. Um, you talk about history, text, structure, uh, but this is a book for a, a general audience. Um, what does a general audience get out of reading your book? What do you want them to know after finishing it? Um, this is a book, as you said, um, uh, Ken, that, uh, that um, is a work of journalism of a certain sort. Um, my earlier books were really inspired by people like Gordon Wood and, and Eric Foner. They're history books of a certain sort. So they tell you a lot about the founding, a lot about the reconstruction, um, the the, the era, that, the progressive era, which gives us um, woman suffrage, direct election of senators, and income tax. So they're history books um, written by someone who's law trained. This one is different. It's a, it's, it collects op-eds that I've written uh, over the last 25 years um, on the hot button issues of my lifetime. Um, and uh, um, it's dedicated to another one of my heroes, Bob Woodward. Uh, so it's in a journalistic tradition. Um, and uh, so uh, what I, uh, because one problem is um, history um, it, uh, doesn't always, uh, and when I write a history book, I'm not always telling you, and here's what that means you should do today. Here's how you should. Uh, the Supreme Court should decide this case, or here's how the senator should vote. 
that's important also. So this is a book all about basically the applied issues of my lifetime, and I sort of reorganize them in a certain way. Um, so the last three chapters, for example, are about our three most recent presidents before the current one. This came out in 2016. Um, and a big constitutional question connected to each of them. For Barack Obama, it was Obamacare. So I've got a whole bunch of op-eds about Obamacare while the thing was unfolding, the debate. Um, and before that, it was W. And I think the big constitutional issue for him is why did he, why was he um, uh, declared the victor when, he, when Al Gore got more votes. So what is it about this Electoral College thing? So, so I had a whole chapter on W and the Electoral College. Um, and for Clinton, um, uh, I don't know if anyone's thought about this at all recently, probably not, but you know, he got impeached. Um, and um, so I wrote about the impeachment process and actually why partisan impeachments are actually problematic. So those are the last three chapters. There are other chapters in which I tell you about how to think about criminal procedure reform or filibuster uh, reform or presidential succession um, or ex executive privilege, just all the issues um, of the last 30 years that have, have, have popped up. <laughs> okay, great. So, so let me ask you another question of Eric. Um, you know, th this is a, it's a, it's a popular book in some measure, you know, sort of un unlike uh, most of the things you've written. Um, <laughs> well, well, no, no, they, they, they have been immensely popular. They sold more than any book I'm ever gonna write. But, but they've, been, they've been directed more to an ad, uh, academic audience. Right. This is directed more to a general audience. What, what's different about this book yeah. than your prior books. Well, it's a lot shorter than many of my previous <laughs> books because uh, attention spans have diminished a little bit lately. Um, and uh, yeah, I tried to write it. I mean, of course, one always wants as many people to read your book as possible, but uh, you're quite right. It's, it's not nearly as heavily footnoted, um, and, and it's, it hones in on just these three amendments. It's not a whole history of Reconstruction. I did do that at considerable length with a lot of footnotes one time. Um, but I, it's really, you know, my, now to say this is, maybe, is immodest, and don't, don't get me wrong, I, I, you know, but my model for this book was actually The Strange Career of Jim Crow mm. by C. Van Woodward, which is a book based on scholarship. I mean, Woodward was a great historian, but written for a general audience, and uh, if I sold as many copies as that, I'd be very happy. <laughs> but that was a model for me of, of clarity of writing, of not overburdening the book with you know, too much in the way of you know, original evidence and everything, and trying to have a straight, uh, a, you know, an argument that runs uh, all the way through it. So, um, you know, I, I did write with, with, because I feel that, you know, again, I'm not a look for that the, these amendments have been in many ways misinterpreted or misused by the Supreme Court. And I'm not just talking about 1900 and 1905, you know, and one can list the cases back there. I'm talking about now, uh, and partly because we live in a jurisprudence of precedent, and therefore what I consider bad decisions of the past are still affecting decisions today. But, you know, uh, so in a way the book is political also. Not, it's not an argument to vote for this person or that person, but it's about where, uh, that there are, is an alternative way of looking at these amendments that the Supreme Court, that is rooted in the actual history, but that the Supreme Court has never fully adopted. And I hope in, maybe in the future with a somewhat different composition of the Supreme Court, they might uh, decide to take a look again at this. Oh, well, that's a, a great segue into my next question, which is really directed at both of you, because um, we're talking about history here. Um, and there certainly is a variety of history that has interested many of the justices of the Supreme Court, and we call that originalism. Mm -hmm. uh, both of you distinguish your work um, from originalist jurisprudence, at least the variety of it invoked by the conservative, some of the conservative members of the present, present members of the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, can, can each of you distinguish what you're doing? How is the history that you're using different than originalism? So I'll ask Akhil yeah. first and then Eric second. Uh, so it, mine is a kind of originalism. There's actually a, an essay here on liberal originalism. Uh, uh, the Warren Court, in my view, was actually 
driven by um, a liberal originalist of sorts. He, he always carried around a copy of the Constitution with him. What a what an odd duck that kind of person um, would 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 be. His, um, his, his name was Hugo Black. Mm -hmm. um, he was FDR's first appointee to the court. He was not. An, he was a former Klansman, um, and he was not altogether honest in his confirmation hearings. That that sort of thing happens. <laughs> um, and yet, I would say he was maybe the greatest justice of my lifetime. Um, and he's the driving intellectual force of the Warren Court. Um, and he helps uh, the court make amends for some of these precedents that Eric talked about. So in 1953, before Warren, uh, let me tell you, 1936, 37, before Hugo Black comes on the court, he, this is America. There's massive segregation in, uh, for much of America, Jim Crow. Um, uh, there's no right to vote that's enforced, and it's not one person, one vote. There's massive malapportionment in many places, and some malapportionment almost everywhere. Uh, the Bill of Rights doesn't generally apply against state and local governments in court, only against the federal government. There's organized sectarian prayer in the schools, um, which is not really equal. Um, the freedom of expression hasn't really been robustly protected by the Supreme Court. Um, uh, and criminal defendants have precious few rights, even they don't even have, if indigent, a rights to a, um, a, a government counsel, a, a lawyer at public expense. Now, the Warren Court changes all of that because Hugo Black reads the text. And he says, you know, it says free speech. Let's do free speech. It says right to vote. Let's do that. It, it says religious equality, free exercise. Let's protect that. It says no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States, um, the fundamental rights. Let's apply those against states as well as um, the federal government. Um, Gandhi was once asked what he thought of Western civilization. And he paused for a moment. He said, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> well, that's Hugo Black's thought, that they're actually, some of these things, like the right to vote, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, these are good ideas. We should do them. Now, that's originalism of a certain sort. It's, it's repudiating precedence in the name of what the text says and really is all about. How is my version any different than standard uh, originalism a la Bork or Scalia or Thomas? Maybe two things. One. Because I'm a student of Eric Foner's as well as Gordon Woods, you know, um, uh, and Gordon, I would say, is the great uh, historian of the founding era, as Eric is of the Reconstruction, I try to give equal weight to the amendments, especially the Reconstruction amendments, the second founding. I would say a third founding with women's suffrage. You know, we need to take seriously the original vision behind women's suffrage, which is that women should be politically equal. I think that would be a good idea, you <laughs> see. And some, uh, some self-described originalists stop with the founding era, and Eric is trying to say that's a mistake. That's you know what he's saying. The second founding, and that's the reconstruction, the reconstitution. So that's one difference. I think I try to pay more attention to the later generations of constitutional text, to the amendments as well as the original document, which has slavery, of course, in it. And ours is an anti-slavery constitution, thanks to Lincoln and Bingham and Ashley and Sumner and and, and the people that that Eric mentioned and Thaddeus Stevens and, and others. Second. Um, I try to read the Constitution holistically, see it as one unified system um, rather than clause by clause. So I tend to look less at, less at dictionaries. Scalia did that because that was easy to do. But if you really are an originalist, you believe in history, you're going to have to study it in great detail. You're going to have to read Eric Foner's books and then reread them. Okay, you don't have to buy them at the library. You know, you can you can get them at the library. No, no, you, no. You, you know, you <laughs> have to buy them. Okay, <laughs> you have to buy them. Okay, um, but um, um, uh, um, originalists believe, and, and and if we don't do that. We're doomed, I believe, because that's what we Americans have in common, is American history. And my forebears weren't here, but I can still claim that narrative, that project. But if I'm going to do it, if it's going to be common ground for all of us, we're going to actually have to know what really did happen at the founding, in the, uh, in the Reconstruction, in the, uh, the Progressive Era. We're going to actually need to. And, and that's why it's so important that people like Eric write stuff that's actually accessible to the rest of us. Um, this book pulls together these op-eds just so that you, 
Each one will take you three minutes to read at most. You can read it on the potty, okay? And that's how <laughs> this generation, they, you know, they don't want to read a big, long book, but maybe just like a little bit at a time. You know, it's, 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 it's like um, 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 uh, um, social media or something, just little snippets at a time. So, but we, you and I do have obligations, actually, yeah, to try to that's, get out that's to... That's our job. Yes. Absolutely. To, to the citizenry. Yeah, I don't, you know, I, when I was working on this book, I kept wondering or thinking about how do I avoid the originalist trap? That is to say, to think that the Constitution today can be understood simply by going back 150 years or 200 years and finding what people said back then. Um, now, f to me, the idea, now again, I'm not a lawyer, et cetera, but the idea of originalism is intellectually incoherent because no, no historian believes that any significant document has only one meaning or one intent. And if you take these three amendments, I mean, they were, they were all compromises. There was all sorts of input into them from different uh, groups of people, different groups of Republicans. Uh, the 14th Amendment, which became far more important than the other two, um, was a series of compromises between different uh, factions in the Republican Party. Um, it, it's very hard to specify a single intent there, but um, on the other hand, as a historian, it's a legitimate question to just say, well, what were they trying to accomplish? Let well, me pick one, for what example. What were they attempting to that, do by that, putting these that, in the Constitution? That you mentioned earlier. Yeah. So, and I take this very personally, um, and this may be why I actually do what I do. On the day that I'm born, the United States Constitution gives me this great gift. It gives me the gift of citizenship. Mm -hmm. I am a birthright citizen, even because I'm born in Ann Arbor, Michigan, full stop. Um, my parents are not citizens at the time. Um, they weren't even green card holders. Now, t truthfully, they weren't here illegally, but they were just students at the time. And I take it that it's not a close question, and this is originalism, the text of the 14th Amendment, the first sentence, really does say right. everyone born in America right. and subject to the jurisdiction thereof is right. a citizen, um, and, and that's confirmed by the history. Well, that's originalism. A certain, and it if is. we don't say that, we can't say, and I'm going to say it, President Trump is completely wrong on that. Uh, right. And that's originalism of a certain Yeah, form. no, th that is completely right. But, but I guess my other point about this, uh, and um, here I was influenced by Professor Max writing, you know, that we have to, if we want to find out what the intent or the original meaning was, we've got to get outside the beltway, not just look at too many, with all due respect, uh, law journal articles about this. Think that if you find a quote from Bingham or you find a speech from Howard or whoever it is, there is your original intent. It's, mm -hmm. it's within Congress. But, you know, the, the whole country was debating yep. these issues. Yep. And where do you, how do you get an African-American voice into this discussion? There was not a single black member of Congress when the 14th Amendment was enacted. And yet, without black voting, no 14th Amendment. Because it required the ratification by states exactly. where due to the Reconstruction Plan, new governments have been created with black men holding office and voting. How do, what did African Americans think the intent of these things was? So that, we've, you know, as a historian, if we're looking for the you know, purposes, we've got to go very I broadly. Agree. I know that you two agree with me, because you, but there are too many legal scholars have a slightly more narrow view of this, uh, and certainly justices. I don't think uh, Justice Scalia was looking at the Mississippi uh, uh, legislators' debates. But let's just take about, that, just you know, even specific, because here's what's amazing the word race does not mm -hmm. appear in the 14th Amendment. Right. Now, it does in the 15th, race, color, right. previous condition of servitude. It does in the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which talks about um, um, people of, of, of various races having the same rights as people of the white race. But, but the, the text itself doesn't say race, and yet, Nothing could be clearer. I think we would uh, yeah. agree that the black codes and the status of former slaves who were blacks mm -hmm. um, 
uh, was at the heart of, the, 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 and that's originalism of a certain sort. You won't find it in a Scalia dictionary, mm -hmm. right. um, but you will find it in the work of Eric Foner <laughs> you know, but, and, but, and but others. The, the, but as you well know, each of those three amendments ends with a section saying Congress will have the power to yes. enforce yes. this amendment. That guaranteed that this is an ongoing process. Yep. In other words, the, the original intent is not frozen at the moment of ratification. It's by Congress for right? Congress. Congress can continue to act in this way and does. I mean, in 1875, they pass a new Civil Rights Act, which does things that actually most of them didn't think they wanted to do 10 years earlier. And yet they said, look, being a citizen, this was to ban discrimination by uh, public accommodations and transportation companies on the, you know, on the base of race. This is part of what it is to be a citizen, they say, in, in the United States, to have to be treated with respect in the public sphere, and the 14th Amendment allows us to do that. Now, later the Supreme Court said, no, you can't, but... And you and I both think that's a tragedy. In right. 1875, thanks right. to a Massachusetts senator named Kennedy, oops, I mean Sumner, <laughs> right on. Um, this thing is passed, the Supreme Court invalidates it, and it won't come back into our law until Lyndon Johnson, using the, the, the legacy of John F. Kennedy, actually gets that law passed as the Civil Rights Act of 1964, even though in large part it simply says again what the Civil Rights Act of 1875 said first. And right. you and I think Congress was right the first time, and the court was, was wrong decision, right. to invalidate all of that, but the ground on which we stand is, it says Congress shall have power to enforce this, right. you know, those but, are the words. Uh, even the Warren Court, as you well know, hasn't, was not willing to say, we were wrong back correct. then in Correct, they hate admitting they're wrong. They go around the old decision rather than saying, look, our predecessors here really blew it, folks, and we're gonna start again and really talk about what these amendments are about. Be, so and that's why you and I, at the last time I testified yeah. before Congress, I actually said that I thought, I, this is what I first said, you can see it on C-SPAN, I catch myself, I said Shelby County, which is a decision which the Supreme right. Court invalidated parts of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, right. which Lyndon Johnson got through as a tribute to John Fitzgerald Kennedy, they invalidated parts of the Voting Rights Act of 65 in a case called Shelby County. This is what you began with, talking about voting rights. Right. And in my testimony, I said, this is the worst case in the last 20, and then I caught myself, mm -hmm. and I said 15 years, because I don't love Bush versus Gore either. <laughs> so, so you'll see me actually, I, I catch my, myself. Right. So, but, but that's because you and I believe yeah. that when you look at the history, mm -hmm. it really is clear that the words mean what they say. Congress has power to enforce this, and right. that meant something. But then there are parts, words in, the, in these amendments, 14th particularly, of course, which don't really explain themselves at all. Privileges and, uh, or immunities yeah, of citizens. Open. Uh, what are those? And, yeah. and there was vast disagreement. I mean, you know, it, as you know, in the last chapter of the book, I talk about this group of black lawyers in Baltimore, the Brotherhood of Liberty. I love their name, the Brotherhood of Liberty. They published a big book, criticized the Supreme Court, which said, you know, the privileges and immunities of citizens include the right to get a good job, the right to an education, things that the Supreme Court has never said are your constitutional rights, you know? And yet this is at the time mm -hmm. pe other people are saying, no, this is to be a citizen, here's what you must mm -hmm. enjoy. So, you know, to say, w w there are a lot of different original intents out yes. there in that period. And, but we can you know, in a sense, it's a political it, question which one you well, want to we pick can, up we on. We can clearly say some things are pretty clearly in. Right. Um, so free speech is in, yeah. and here's you know, one reason, I, I remember reading, Eric, you know, one of your first <laughs> books on the free soil. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the Republican Party slogan, like you know, hope and change, or make America great again, or we like I, <laughs> uh, um, in 1856, the Republican Party for the first time fields a presidential candidate, John C. Fremont, the pathfinder to us, and, and their slogan, say, this is what we believe, Free speech, free yes. press, free soil, free labor, free men, 
Fremont. Okay, so that's, again, you won't find it in a dictionary, but if you, if you read Eric Foner's work and you study history, you say, ah, they clearly thought, surely, that if anything was a privilege or immunity of citizens that no state should free abridge, speech. free speech and free press have to be up there. Now, exactly right. how far you go, but, but we can start by saying, this is clearly in, this is clearly right. in, right. you know, uh, we're in favor of Western civilization, we're in favor of, <laughs> of, of religious um, um, free exercise, and we're in favor of due process and jury trial trials and, 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 um, th those, and some of those things are pretty clearly in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. <laughs> we could keep going. But uh, I think we should move to the elephant in the room, uh, which yes. is impeachment, of course. Mr. That Moore. elephant. Certainly. Um, get questions from the audience and about this in the Q&A. But, but I would just start by noting that both of you have relevant expertise on the subject of impeachment. Um, Eric, certainly on the impeachment of Andrew Johnson uh, during the Reconstruction era. Uh, Akhil has written about this as well. Akhil is, is oh, of course, a, an expert on the history, text, and structure of the Constitution. But of course, I noticed there was a recent op-ed in Common Dreams where someone says, why doesn't the Judiciary Committee call Eric Foner? <laughs> they need to call Eric Foner. <laughs> They, they haven't called a historian. <laughs> they should have said, why don't they call Eric Foner or Akhil Amar? Right. So each of you. Um, <laughs> Here's our chance. Yes. What, what does your work say to our present debate about impeachment? What's not being said? Uh, what could Congress or the public or President Trump yeah. learn from your explorations of, of history. I, I really uh, think Akhil knows a lot more about impeachment than I do. I know a lot about the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. My former student, uh, Manisha Sinha, who teaches Brilliant. in Connecticut, wrote Brilliant a person. very good article a couple of weeks ago in the New York Times comparing uh, President Trump and Andrew Johnson. And they do have uh, a number of uh, qualities uh, in common. Um, uh, uh, in fact, I used to think that Andrew Johnson was the worst president in American history. <laughs> uh, but uh, now, now there's a fight, fight for that designation. But, um, you know, uh, it, it, the impeachment of Andrew Johnson uh, w was quite different. Uh, number one, uh, Johnson had no party behind him at this time. He didn't have 53 or whatever his members of the Senate, as Trump does, who it seems are never going to vote to impeach no matter what happens. Johnson was elected as a Republican, sort of, with Lincoln, even though he'd been a Democrat all his life, but a Unionist, stayed with the, 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 in the Union when his state, Tennessee, succeeded was, seceded was, um, uh, you know, military governor of Tennessee under Lincoln during the war, and was put on the ticket uh, as vice president because, as a way of trying to appeal to what many Republicans thought was a large number of white Southerners who really had opposed secession and might join up with the Republican Party after the war. Uh, you know, people are put on the ticket as vice president to appeal to one group or another group. That's pretty, uh, pretty typical. Um, but Johnson turned out to be a deeply racist, deeply incompetent, unable to work with Congress, no sense, and no sense of uh, public sentiment, and, you know, uh, fought Congress all the way on Reconstruction policy without going into all the details. And um, basically, Congress just got fed up with him. And uh, you know, even though the articles of impeachment, apparently there's only going to be two articles of impeachment I, I read today on my phone, which may or may not be accurate. Uh, but um, there were 11 against Johnson. And most of them had to do with violating the Tenure of Office Act, a specific law, although most people thought that law was kind of questionable anyway. Um, but the last, the final, the 11th, was really why they wanted to get rid of him, I because agree. they just couldn't stand the guy anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but he, he was impossible, he was incompetent, he was constantly badgering Congress, insulting them, he was trying to obstruct the implementation of congressional reconstruction policy. Um, but the question is, is that impeachable? You know, just, just being impossible, you know, and, and someone that you'd like to get rid of. Um, so they actually put all this violation of the law in. But I don't know, actually, even I'm a historian, if there are that many lessons one can learn from the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. Johnson, of course, was not convicted. They came one vote short of the two-thirds required to convict and remove from office. 
although it's pretty clear that a kind of a deal was made between a number of Republican senators and Johnson's lawyer, William Everts, who was a very prominent attorney at the time, and Everts basically promised, look, if you let this guy stay, it's only a few more months in his term, uh, he will behave himself, I promise. He's not gonna cause any problem. And in fact, he did, he shut up after that, and he didn't bother Congress, and uh, they went forward with their plan of reconstruction. So the acquittal of Johnson really didn't have much effect. I mean, things kept going. So, um, I'm not sure, I, I'm interested in what Akil says here, uh, and also, Kenneth, about what the current uh, status of impeachment is from a constitutional point of view. Yeah. Akil. Um, so I'm gonna ask Eric later, because one thing I've never fully understood, I've, I've tried to find out this, is to what extent Lincoln himself pushed Hannibal Hamlin off the ticket and said, We don't really you know. know the, I Link, want Johnson. Lincoln I, is a very uh, cagey guy, yeah, you know? Yeah, and so that's the one thing I would actually like no, to know. In well, fact, you know, Hamlin didn't necessarily want to stay on. It, it, being vice president was a real bore. You know, when Lincoln issued the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation in September 1862, yeah. he got a letter from Hamlin saying, Oh, great, congratulations, that's a great, he had not even discussed it with his vice president. Hamlin was surprised like everyone else when this was, so he had no part in the administration. Mm -hmm. And he, in leaving the vice presidential office, he then became collector of the Port of Boston, which is a much more lucrative job. That is a good gig. Uh, whether <laughs> if, uh, legitimately or not. And uh, <laughs> uh, you know, so uh, it's not clear that he even wanted to stay on as uh -huh. vice Lincoln was a young guy. He was in his 50s. Nobody yeah. expected Lincoln so to not. So we don't really know if, if we he. We do not know. Lincoln said, okay, I leave I, it. I've, I've tried to find this out. I leave it to the convention. That's okay. what he said. But yeah. there but are he's those. Wily. No, the, he's why He didn't want to publicly. Yeah. I, I think it was, he was perfectly happy with Johnson okay. on the ticket because Lincoln, one of his few miscalculations, I think, was he considerably exaggerated the number of white Southerners who would be appealed, you know, who would be joining the Republican Party. And uh, he, th but he thought, uh, he understood after the war, you know, he hadn't gotten a vote in the South in 1860. Not a single one. And so uh, they needed Southern yeah. support. And of course, the radicals said, well, yeah, there's a lot of people in the South who'll vote Republican, but they happen to be black. So we got to give black people the right to vote. And, even at that point, many Republicans were nervous about that. So here are just a yeah. couple of, uh, so I, I, you know, because I've actually researched it, I've never, because Lincoln no doesn't direct have evidence. His, you know, I've never been able to find quite, if, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the secret message from Lincoln to his operatives. <laughs> right. Um, okay, here are a few things you can say. You can say that, and this confirms what the text says, Mere political disagreement should never be a sufficient basis for impeachment. I'll, I'll show you what actually good originalism. I, I'm very proud of the following argument I'm gonna make to you and then I'll cash it out with um, uh, <laughs> Johnson. It can't be enough to simply say he's a Republican and I'm a Democrat, mm -hmm. okay? Here's why. Um, imagine you have a bill and it's veto. Now in order to override the veto, you need two thirds of the House two-thirds of the Senate. Now, if it was sufficient ground, just that I don't like someone, and they have good faith political views, I have different ones, you could get around that veto provision by just impeaching and convicting the um, vetoing president, and you don't even need two-thirds, two-thirds, you need simple, simple majority two-thirds, and that would be an end around the veto, and that's not right, so that proves you see that high crimes and misdemeanors really is about misbehavior. Maybe it doesn't have to be criminal, but it's about misbehavior rather than a mere political disagreement. That's a structural argument I just made. It's not about this word or that one. It's seeing the system. Oh, there's this veto provision over here. There's this impeachment provision over here. They've got different voting rules, and it would be a Maginot line to say vetoes can't be overridden except with two-thirds of each house if you could impeach the fellow and convict him with a lesser showing. Now, Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson vetoed bills 22 times. I got that from, I think probably from Eric's book, um, Reconstruction, mm -hmm. and the veto was overridden 15 times, more than anyone bef uh, in American history. The most, the, um, Andrew Johnson is the first president in American history 
who gets overridden on a major issue, the Civil, Civil Rights, Rights Act, Act of, you see, I read his book, yeah. right. um, I get it, I'm getting it all from Eric, um, <laughs> Civil Rights Act of 1866, okay, which is a companion to the 14th Amendment. The first sentences about birthright citizenship are almost identical. There's a little difference. So, so these are companion things. And, and, and once Congress says, ah, we can get two-thirds to override his veto, they think, oh, we can get two-thirds for constitutional amendments, too, because it's the same um, voting rule. Okay, 15 veto overrides. So they're talking about you know, real disagreement, but they still don't convict him, you see? So it's not enough merely to dislike the person's policies. So that's a, um, that's a structural argument, and now I connected it to the Andrew Johnson impeachment. Um, now what I say in this book, and I wrote it before Trump, I, I'm, I'm a Hillary Clinton person, I thought she would be elected president, but, but I think the rules of constitutional law are the same for both parties. What goes round comes round, it's not supposed to be partisan. Uh, um, so my chapter on the Clinton impeachment, and I was an advisor in that process, um, I, I advised Senator Biden, um, and I testified um, in the most recent impeachment, which was of a judge, a very corrupt judge named Thomas Porteous. I worked with Adam Schiff. I'm, again, I'm a Democrat and I've worked with Democrats. I thought the Clinton impeachment was ill-advised because it was partisan because only the Republicans were on board and the Democrats weren't. Well, if that's my view last time around, and this chapter is all about the partisan impeachment, oh, I'm not so sure this time. Here's, I'm gonna bring in the Nixon case. Because he, he wasn't impeached, but he left office because he would have been impeached and convicted. But here's the key point. Members of his own party, members of his own coalition, turned against him saying, we don't stand for that, that's not who we are. That's Fred Thompson of Law and Order fame, I mean <laughs> Arthur Branch, that's um, Lowell Weicker, that's Howard Baker, what did the president know and when did he know it? That's at the end of the day, Mr. Republican, Barry Goldwater, they all said, we're loyal Republicans, but this is not what we proper Republicans stand for. We helped elect you, we're part of your coalition and now we're turning on you. That's what I've been looking for in this process and haven't seen yet. And I do think that's actually an, an important thing that ideally you don't want your impeachments to be partisan in the House and here's why. Because if they're partisan in the House, it's not gonna be much different probably in the Senate and you can't get to two thirds without buy-in from both political parties as a general proposition. Reconstruction was an unusual moment in, in that regard because the, um, the South wasn't um, in, uh, uh, the, the white South wasn't um, uh, represented in, 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 in Congress. So um, how are you gonna feel, my fellow Democrats, if we impeach the fellow and there's a party line vote in the, the Senate which seems to bless what he's done, are we gonna be better off that? And, and maybe we are, but those are the questions I'd want actually um, my fellow citizens uh, to think about because impeachment is never a duty, it's merely a power. You don't have to do it. You could do things less like censure and all the rest. So um, I'll be really honest with you. I voted against him, I'm gonna vote him against him uh, again um, and to me the most important thing of all is that he's not president on January 21st um, of 2021. And if an impeachment makes it more likely that he's reelected, because you unify and energize the Republican base, what have you accomplished? That, those are at least structural constitutional law questions that I just want my fellow citizens to think through. Mm -hmm. so this is why the Judiciary Committee didn't call Correct. <laughs> That's right. Now you know. They didn't want to hear that. Because neither side likes what I just said, that he's you know, a complete crumb, you know, and I can name a hundred different reasons why you know, he's met the standard for removal, but does it make sense, actually, mm -hmm. given we're about to have an election? Okay. Let's do another one, which, you know, <laughs> okay. it's sort of come up already, but birthright citizenship. Right. Um, mm. Eric, you explained this in your, in your book. Uh, it's, it's in the Civil Rights Act of 1866, a slightly different version then it's in the 14th Amendment mm -hmm. for, for the first time uh, subject to the jurisdiction thereof. Mm -hmm. But where does birthright citizenship come from? How does it get Well, uh, my very good former student, Martha Jones, wrote a book last year called Birthright Citizens. Yes. 
and it's about free African Americans before the Civil War claiming the rights of citizenship, which they were frequently denied. It, before the Civil War, it was the states that basically determined who was a citizen mm -hmm. and what rights citizens had. Mm -hmm. So African Americans were citizens of Massachusetts, and in fact, uh, there were f some, but very few, discriminatory laws in Massachusetts. However, many other states did not recognize free African Americans as citizens, so there was no national standard. It was generally assumed that birth in the United States meant you were a citizen for white people, but that's not birthright citizenship. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. birthright citizenship by race. Um, the Supreme Court, of course, in Dred Scott said no black person can be a citizen of the United States anywhere in the country. So, um, and they made that up. Yeah, well, that, that Lincoln, Supreme Court is a way of doing that. Yeah, and Lincoln But that said, was an originalist decision, well, the weirdly enough. But so were the dissenters who right. actually in, had in the a better view of, of Chief the Chief Justice Taney said, look, uh, we, I'm going with what the founders meant. Right. Uh, and the dissenters called um, And they said that's BS ridiculous. Right. And Lincoln calls that decision, I, I love this uh, word, an astonisher right. in legal history. Lincoln denounced it, and uh, many Republicans denounced it, but um, the... Um, the, 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 re, the 14th Amendment puts this notion of birthright citizenship severed from race, is the key point, uh, in the Constitution. The, but now, that was only added at the, verse, at the last minute, as you Correct. know. Mm -hmm. When it passed the House, it didn't have that Correct. because they'd already passed the Civil Rights Bill, which said, right. now, the one group, of course, excluded were Native Americans living on reservations. In tribes, right who were still considered citizens of their tribal right. sovereignty. Right. They'd be so, like the, you know, a, yeah, the French the, nation, the German right. nation. It's not until 1924 Russian that a law is passed giving all Native Americans American citizenship wherever they're living or, or what. Um, but um, you know, it, it it's really comes out of the anti-slavery movement. It does. It comes, as Martha points out in her book, these free black conventions, which met frequently before the Civil War, they called themselves conventions of colored citizens. Yep. They claimed that citizenship, which the society was not willing to actually recognize, and they put it on the agenda. And then, really, I think the service of black soldiers in the Civil War, 200,000 of them in the That's Army and Navy, uh, places this issue right on the agenda. I People agree. who have fought and died for the nation yep. have a claim to citizenship in, in the post-war uh, United States. Um, but it clears it up. I mean, with the, the 14th Amendment, it's clear who is a citizen of the United States. And the president cannot, by executive order, abrogate that, right. even though President Trump has said he can. Right. And now, let me just um, add a few uh, that's mm -hmm. spectacular local elements to this. So first, um, uh, blacks fought at Lexington and Conquered. Uh, right. Prince Esther Brooks and, and others, and Bunker Hill. And the newspapers say all that. And if you see John Trumbull's painting of the Battle of Bunker's Hill, there's actually a black person in the right corner of the screen as you're looking at the, the picture. Um, they fought in Washington's army. 10% of Washington's army, by some estimates, um, are, are, are black. Some are slaves, some are, are, are free blacks. Um, South Carolina in the Articles Confederation wants to put the wi word white in, and they lose on that. The word white, um, in 1778, the Massachusetts a proposed Massachusetts Constitution is put forth that has a racial test for voting, and it gets voted down by the people of this state, in part because of the racial test. The people, I've never been to a place called Georgetown, but apparently the township of Georgetown in Massachusetts says, you know, we're rejecting this in part because a person who's black, uh, who's African or Indian, or maybe too sunburned. They're, they're mocking, you know, can't, you know, um, like social construction 200 years ago, you know, can't vote. And so the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780 has no race test, the one uh, uh, drafted by um, John Adams, and the Constitution doesn't say race, um, and it could have, and Tawney makes it all up when he says, oh, you got to be white, or you, you can't be black to be a citizen. That's one of the three things the Dred Scott case says. And he says this as a matter of originalism, but the dissenters say, you just made all that up. Then Lincoln gets elected. His attorney general, Bates, actually issues mm -hmm. passports to black people. They're, they're citizens. But can he do that? Can you just disregard a Supreme Court opinion? So then Congress passes a statute, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, 
you know, saying, for a sentence, you know, everyone born in America basically, except for the Native Americans and tribes, is a citizen. But can you overrule the Supreme Court by a mere statute? So that's why they put it in the 14th Amendment, belt and suspenders, just to, to be sure, you know, clear that there's a constitutional, because because I told you that was the first statute that got over, uh, that, that was passed over President's veto, and Johnson vetoed it in part saying, you can't do this, the Dred right. Scott case says you can't do this, this is an unconstitutional statute. But if you have two thirds to pass it over Johnson's veto, right. you also have two thirds to put it in a constitutional amendment, assuming you get enough support in the states, and that's what they do. And I want to make one final point, and it's a shout out to one of your great colleagues, Jerry Newman. Mm -hmm. who first made this point, and I repeat it, but he gets the credit. He says, ooh, this is clearly, 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 and this is originalism. You won't find it just in the words. You need to know the historical context which he gave you. This is about overruling Dred Scott, constitutionalizing the Civil Rights Act of 1866, and it's about African-American citizenship at its core, the citizenship of um, former slaves who have now been freed and, son and children of former slaves. Here's Jerry Newman's brilliant point at one of his colleagues um, um, at that school up in Cambridge that, that sticks <laughs> in the throat of us Yaleys. Um, I'm just joking, it's a great uh, place. Jerry Newman says, some of the slaves were technically illegal aliens. That it, the, um, uh, after 1808, Congress made it illegal to import slaves right, from right. Africa. There still was a slave trade illegally conducted. When Lincoln finds out about it, he actually um, uh, supports the death penalty for a slave trader. And Nathaniel Lincoln, Daniel Gordon, right. and Lincoln, Executed. you know, you know, is is very merciful, but he hates the slave trade, and, and this is really evil stuff. So. But people are smuggling in slaves illegally, as is true today with the sex trade. That's happening in New York City today. It, it, it is. Okay. Don't just blame New York City, yeah, please. Oh, That's okay. where I live. Okay. <laughs> but but um, um, so some of the slaves were technically illegal aliens, and nothing could be more clear as an originalist matter than every child of slaves born in America is a citizen. That's birthright citizenship, not just for people like me, whose, whose parents aren't citizens but are here legally, but even for p uh, children of so-called um, illegal aliens or undocumented aliens or unauthorized aliens, pick your, pick. And, the, and that's an originalist yeah. point from the great Jerry right. Newman. There's one other little point here which is interesting, that in the 1790s and early 1800s, the government w started issuing citizenship papers to black sailors. American black sailors, because the British were impressing, you know, that's one of the right. causes of the War of 1812. Right. The British were grabbing people off American ships saying they're British and they have to go into our Navy. Right. And so they gave these black sailors these documents saying this is a citizen of the United States. And that was a problem down in South Carolina, the, in right. the Supreme Court but, justice. Right. And it also, that is how Frederick Douglass escaped from slavery. Oh, I didn't know yes, that. Yes, he okay. borrowed the citizenship papers of a black sailor he knew in Baltimore. And so he didn't run through the woods, he took a train. And if, they, if the conductor asked him, he just pulled out his, uh, his citizenship oh, cool. paper. Oh, cool. So the idea of black citizenship was not unknown by any means, but it certainly wasn't secure uh, until the 14th Amendment. This is great. So productive discussion so far. I think it's time to invite members of the audience to participate. Um, we're going to have, um, I think we're going to have microphones in the aisles. Uh, sorry? Okay. So we are good. Think about your questions. A um, couple of things. Um, it should be phrased in the form of a question. <laughs> Not a the speech. Jeopardy rule. It should be succinct so we get as many questions in as possible. Um, and we've got two microphones. So um, we'll start with the gentleman over there. Okay. My name is Bob and uh, this is a this is a really quick question. Uh, you ever seen pictures of Taney and uh, uh, Johnson? I mean, those were two ugly guys, <laughs> ugly, and they gave some of the most horrific decisions of all time. The other thing is, does anybody wheel Clarence Thomas into the Supreme Court? He hasn't done anything. <laughs> now. As far as the Supreme Court goes, 
if Ruth Bader Ginsburg unfortunately winds up in a situation where I can't even say his name gets a chance to put in one more uh, uh, Supreme Court justice do you think that we could be heading in a 180 and doing a complete and total reversal going right back to the Taney Court <laughs> okay. or something like it? So, I mean, both of you have sort of, I mean, Eric, you've touched on this in the book. Are, are yeah, we in the 1890s? Yeah, I mean, we have, in, in 1892, I think it was, Frederick Douglass gave a speech in which he said, principles that we thought had been, you know, securely achieved are now being challenged and overthrown. He was quite elderly at the time. He was seeing much of his life's work being taken away, not just by the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court certainly played a role in the retreat from the egalitarian ideals of the Civil War and Reconstruction. So it has happened. My point to you is it has happened in the past that the Supreme Court has rolled back rights that were taken for granted until much, you know, very quickly, uh, soon before that. I would not want to predict what would happen if another uh, appointment was made to the Supreme Court, but I think you would then have a very secure conservative majority, ultra conservative majority, uh, and uh, there is no way of, you know, there are alternative views that to what we have put forward, uh, which are quite common in the Federalist Society and groups like that, which really would put, maybe not back to Tawney, but certainly back before the New Deal and, um, you know, back to some of those decisions that Akil and I have said were wrongly uh, conceived. So I think it would be a very, uh, a, 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 it would be a very dangerous situation, no question about it. I'm a little more optimistic. Um, so uh, uh, very specifically, if your measure of all things is Roe versus Wade, then you shouldn't sleep well at night because right. you should be very uneasy because um, that's uh, um, um, at risk. Mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, just even on that, 80% of abortions occur in about eight states, um, and they're going to have um, uh, uh, their state laws permitting this no matter what the Supreme Court does. So we're actually talking about 20% of abortions. So if that's your measure of all things, oh, yeah, there's, there could be a significant um, roll back, whether uh, an outright overturning or death by a thousand cuts by allowing all sorts of regulations. But if it's anything other than that, I'm much less alarmist, uh, much more optimistic. Um, I think the, um, the, uh, um, the presidency, is d uh, the current president, and to my mind, is deeply troubling. Congress is deeply dysfunctional. Our courts are doing quite well. They're not partisans in general. They're not hacks. In the biggest case of his life, John Roberts sided with Obamacare and then uh, Sebelius case and then did it again in a case called King versus Burwell and then on the census case did it a third time. Um, Anthony Kennedy often voted with um, uh, his Republican colleagues but in some of the biggest cases in life, four cases about gay rights building on the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts in the Goodrich decision by Chief Justice Margaret Marshall in Romer versus Evans um, and Lawrence versus Texas and Windsor and Obergefell actually join liberal colleagues. The courts, in my view, in general, are not quite hacks and partisans. Um, the Congress, I'm not vouching for. Um, and, and I've testified before them over 30 years. Bush, and, you don't consider you know, Bush v. Was, Gore? That was horrible. Okay, <laughs> right, and that's what I remember. Those partisan, two cases right. stuck in my throat. But right, they actually, know. <laughs> you know, no justice since Bush versus Gore has cited with approval. I think they're deeply embarrassed by it. Mm -hmm. um, and so in general, that's, it's, it's, the, it's exactly what you don't see day in and day out, that mm -hmm. kind of, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so on <laughs> some of the things we're talking about. Um, I'm a Democrat. Republicans have been in control of the Supreme Court for my entire adult lifetime, since 1970, basically. And there was just a moment when Justice Scalia passed away when it was four to four, okay? So um, it's not gonna be anything diff that different than what we've had before. But on just the issues we've talked about, I quite adore Anthony Kennedy. No relation to a, a Jack, but still, great <laughs> man. Um, uh, on 
reconstruction amendments, I actually think his law clerk, Brett Kavanaugh, may be better from the liberal point of view, from the phoner point of view, from the congressional power point of view, and taking seriously, actually, the second founding, then um, Maybe yeah. so. Now, so Gorsuch, let's hope so. Gorsuch was an undergraduate at Columbia, but made the serious error of never taking my class <laughs> but if he's, on the Civil War and Reconstruction. But if he says an or, he's an originalist, we're going to make right. him actually walk that walk. And, uh, you know, and every year, right. you should send him, uh, you know, as a Christmas gift, Eric Foner's <laughs> book saying, you know, you know, um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a father uh, uh, for, for um, a flag day or something, you've got your summer off, why don't you read Eric Foner on the second founding? Because if you're an originalist, you've got to take seriously By the, the way, I, I sent it to all nine of them when it came well, out. And good. And I yes. have three very polite thank you notes from the three women. <laughs> really? They're, they're obviously more polite than the yes. six guys, whatever their politics. Women right. in general are better on thank you notes, <laughs> right. my wife has told me. Okay, okay. so a question over here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Susan. I have to say to Amar, I, ha I have to respond to some things he said, so if that's okay. A um, question, though. Yes, well, I'll go back to what you were saying about the impeachment today. And you were saying, <clears throat> because this impeachment, even though it's turning out to be Democrats against Republicans, that's to the shame of the Republicans. Yes, Because this man has done enough impeachable things f to last the next 25 years. Mm -hmm. But I don't, it's not, I don't, I think it has to be done. They have to say what this person has done. Mm -hmm. You can't leave it and just say, leave it alone and have an election. Let the people decide. Mm -hmm. They already made a big mistake. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I'm saying, it has to be put out there. He's going to win. I mean, the Senate's not going to impeach him. And if it's, if it's put forth properly by the media, saying, well, he did do those things, all those things. <coughs> I mean, it, um, just because he wasn't impeached, the Senate is totally part of it. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean mm -hmm. what Trump did okay. Mm -hmm. And anybody who says that, it's appalling, really. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's why I didn't say that. But just, just so we actually, on one small little technical point, so we're all on the same page, and I used to make, say this all the time, but just technically, the House impeaches. Um, and yeah. Bill Clinton was impeached. Yeah. Andrew Johnson was impeached by the House. They weren't convicted by the Senate. So, um, and, and, and you can have something that it's not quite an impeachment, it's called a censure. It has a very similar effect. The House says this is unacceptable, but the guy still stays in. But, 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 um, but Richard Nixon resigned before that happened, but both Clinton and Johnson were impeached. They just weren't convicted. Mm -hmm. Clinton was impeached, okay. totally political. Okay, so uh, we have. Thank you. Question over here. Uh, my name's Andy. Um, tell us about the emollients clause and how it uh, applies to our current administration. <laughs> oh, it's really, really complicated. <laughs> there are about eight different issues there, and um, the most important thing to um, understand about the emoluments clause is that Congress, if it wants, can authorize um, uh, uh, the, the receipt of some um, uh, gift um, or, or some benefit. But the, the, the honest answer is there are about four different complexities in the Emoluments Clause. Come up to me afterwards and I'll explain what those <laughs> complexities are. Um, <laughs> it's a very 18th century word and there are, are, are these issues and I'll, I'll go through them one by one for you. <laughs> but it, the answer is it's complicated. <laughs> a good professor answer. Um. Um, I'd like to ask you about the relationship between citizenship and voting rights because you can be a citizen and not have voting rights. Children are citizens. Yes. You can, in some places, have voting rights in local elections without being a citizen. Right. So did this understanding change with the second founding or with the 19th Amendment? That's a very good question. Um, it depends who you ask or who you look to. The 14th Amendment, which creates in the Constitution birthright citizenship, does not give anybody the right to vote. It does have a convoluted clause reducing a state's representation in Congress if it denies groups of men, not women unfortunately, 
the right to vote. By the way, parenthesis, I'm starting a movement to enforce the second section of the 14th oh, Amendment. Oh, God bless you, I agree. Because many states have thrown thousands of people off their voting agree, rolls, and maybe if we calculate, maybe enough to lose a member of Congress. It's uh -huh. never been enforced, though. But anyway, as soon as the, then the 15th Amendment says, you cannot deny a person, a citizen, the right to vote because of race, but it leaves open numerous other grounds, including sex, that states can deny uh, people the right to vote. On the other hand, as soon as the 14th Amendment was passed, you had the, the women's suffrage advocates saying voting is a privilege or immunity of citizenship, and we are citizens, and we should therefore have the right to vote. And in 1872, some of them went and voted. Susan B. Anthony went and voted in the presidential election and was arrested and fined and refused to pay her fine, and the Grant administration kind of said, all right, forget about it. They didn't want her languishing in jail because she would, uh, had voted. But the, in our, you and know. And then in 1875, the Supreme Court. In minor, in minor yeah, versus Happer said, said. Said, no, you don't have the right to vote. <laughs> but um, uh, it's, it's very complicated. And then, of course, you're right. The, the, the women's suffrage amendment, which we are soon to celebrate the 50th anniversary of, uh, says you cannot deny someone the right to vote because of hundredth, sex. Hundredth. Hmm? Hundredth anniversary. Hundredth, right, sorry. You're completely right. Um, but again, there are other grounds, and states today are denying people the right to vote on grounds not of race, not of sex, or at least not explicitly, yeah. but uh, IDs, and sometimes if you haven't voted in two elections, they kick you off the rolls, or right. various kinds of requirements. Yep. These are, so it's, it's complex. We, our Constitution does not contain a positive right to vote. Right. It does not say, hey, all, and by the way, that's what the radical Republicans wanted with the 15th Amendment. Correct. They yeah. said, well, not just race, we think all, and unfortunately only men, all adult male citizens, 21 years age, have the right to vote. If they had gotten that into the Constitution, it would have solved a lot of problems, but they didn't. So um, yes, the answer is what you said. You can be a citizen and not have the right to vote. And certainly in the 19th century, there were plenty of states that allowed immigrants to vote before they became naturalized citizens. So African Americans living here, maybe through three or four generations, could not vote in most states. And yet an Irish immigrant off a boat in New York could probably vote a week after he turned up. So just very quickly, mm -hmm. the words right to vote didn't appear in the original Constitution because of slavery and race. As soon as we get rid of slavery, we can st amendment. start to do it in Section 2 of the 14th Fourth Amendment. Right. And now appears in five different amendments, 14th Amendment Section 2, 15th Amendment Section, which is saying if you don't let uh, people vote, you pay a penalty, your state, in, in uh, uh, House and Electoral College apportionment. 15th Amendment Section 1, no race-based deprivations of voting rights, 19th Amendment Section 1, no sex-based deprivation of voting rights, and then the 24th and 26th Amendments, which are about um, poll tax disfranchisement and 18-year-olds voting, um, you know, in my, those are in my lifetime. So it says right to vote now five times. If you're a holist, which is I want you to be, I want you to read the whole system and see now we have a system. It's an archipelago. It's not five little discrete islands. It's Hawaii. It's a, a whole system and we want to think about it um, as a system. Since you're, you know, you, sh and you probably are a lawyer, so you, you know, <laughs> yes, a, 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 a five-year-old um, born in America is a citizen and she doesn't vote, he doesn't vote, um, and they're citizens and contrary-wise, um, aliens have been allowed to vote, especially in local school board elections and, and, and elsewhere. The best piece on that um, is by uh, Jamie Raskin. He's now a member of Congress. He's a former law professor. Um, and you might want to sort of read it by uh, uh, Jamie Raskin. He's actually on the House Judiciary Committee, I think, and has a very interesting um, um, analysis of um, uh, uh, um, uh, non-citizen voters. Here's one little interesting thing. I bet Eric knows this because he knows everything about Reconstruction. <laughs> but um, the draft was of citizens. Um, uh, they didn't want to call it a draft because that raised some constitutional questions, but the, you know, they, they have this conscription act, basically, of, of, of 1863, and it led to riots in New York City. I'm not dumping on New York City, it's just that's, <laughs> that's where the riots were. Um, only citizens generally were drafted except certain aliens who had already voted uh, actually were subject to, 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 to the draft, and other aliens weren't, interestingly enough. Interesting, okay. And, uh, 
I'd recommend my uh, colleague Alex Kesar's book. Oh, yes, called brilliant, called right The Right to Vote. To vote. Yes. Spectacular right. book. Um, I'm not sure it won the Bancroft the way Eric's have, but it was, a, it was nominated <laughs> for it's the good. Bancroft. It's, it's a good great book. book. Right. Yeah. Ah, so I think we're the Hello, gentleman over here. Hello, I'm Ray, um, and I wanted to thank the three of you. Uh, it would be an honor to be in the presence of any one of you and to have all three <laughs> of you here together is really uh, quite a, a, an embarrassment of riches. I have a very, I have a two-part question. One's a very specific question for Professor Amar, um, and that has to do with um, your structural argument about impeaching and vetoing. Can you share any background or evidence you su have seen or didn't see with respect to that structure being a deliberate thing. Mm -hmm. And then my second question has more to do with a comment you made earlier about feeling an obligation to educate. You obviously each have, an, each of the three of you has an obligation to educate in your positions as a professor at a law school or at a, at a Columbia University. But um, why do you feel a, a greater obligation to educate the public as a whole through writing a book to the public? Um, so uh, very specifically, I do think that my structural argument is confirmed by text, which is you know how intentional was it? Um, textual uh, ideas that uh, you can only be impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors. Now misdemeanors doesn't mean it's not a technical term like felony versus misdemeanor. It basically means misbehavior of a certain gross and malignant sort. How gross? How malignant? Something as grotesque as bribery and treason, which are specifically mentioned. So. Um, it's not actually misbehavior to be a Democrat or a Republican or to have vetoed a bill in good faith, you know, as opposed to having taken a bribe to veto a bill, um, or to be a Catholic or a Protestant. So, so the, those structural ideas that mere good faith um, dis political disagreement should not be a pro it's not a vote of no confidence um, merely, and and it's a trial. And it's a and and it's a um, uh, uh, and it it it, it uh, generates a punishment. Punishment says the Constitution in case of impeachment cannot extend beyond removal and disqualification, which is a dishonor. So it's not just like a, um, a vote of no confidence that, uh, or recall or something. We just want someone else. You can never just say, you know, I um, uh, vote against Bill because I prefer Al Gore, or I vote against Al Gore because I prefer, God forbid, Newt Gingrich or something. That's never sufficient. So that's the structure as confirmed by the text. Um, uh, I, I'm speaking too much, but just on obligation, if you're a constitutional, if you're a, a tax professor or something, that's a very specialized area. Maybe you're just writing for you know, um, uh, tax practitioners or something. But if you do constitutional law, you're talking about a document that begins with the words, we the people, that got put to a vote, that is ultimately amendable by um, um, democratic processes. So, oh, you have a special obligation if you believe in um, what this text is saying. It's all about we the people. The words the people appear five times in the first 10 amendments. First amendment, uh, right of people to petition assembly. Second amendment, to keep and bear arms. Fourth amendment, um, uh, search and seizure. Ninth and 10th amendments. So if it's all about the people, if that's what I think when I read it, oh, I have an obligation to try to write for ordinary people. And, and I'm going to say one other thing, speaking of obligations. I think we not only have freedom of speech, we have a duty to listen. We have an obligation to try to listen to people that we politically disagree with, even though that's very painful for us to do. But the system doesn't work if we don't try to do that. Um, do you want to speak well, to Well, you know, I, I, my mentor long ago was the great historian Richard Hofstadter, who supervised my doctoral dissertation back in the 1960s. And um, he, wa he really emphasized to us the necessity, A, of good writing, which he was a brilliant writer, and B, of trying to bring good, up-to-date history to as broad an audience as we could uh, and uh, outside the ivory tower. And the Columbia University History Department, partly because we're in New York City, had many, over the years, scholars, very, very good scholars, who were popularizers in the best sense. That is to say, they tried to bring good history in a way that is accessible to people. And today, you know, people like Alan Brinkley, Mark Mazower today, uh, one can mention a whole bunch of them. Go back, Alan Nevins, Henry Steele Comedy, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and Hofstadter, of course. Um, we were taught that. That's part of our obligation. 
And a lot of universities don't seem to feel that way. I mean, there are, I know history departments where people are sort of penalized for publishing a book with a commercial press rather than an academic press. To me, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a good book, obviously, what, what does it matter? You know, you want it to reach a broader audience. So, you know, uh, and I believe as a historian that it is beneficial for people in a democracy to know our history. Uh, I don't expect everyone to be a scholar of history, but particularly about Reconstruction, for so long there were all sorts of misconceptions and just lies that dominated. Thanks to Columbia and part yeah, with Burgess. Thanks to my predecessor, William Dunning. Um, yeah. That's no longer really the case. Yeah. I, I think what the problem now is just lack of knowledge. I, I think the old view is not really that widespread anymore. Yeah. But um, I think the more people, uh, knowing about this era yeah. is important because <laughs> exactly of how many of those issues are still on our agenda today. I, I read one historian who put it this way, you know, a country without a, sort of a, a narrative and an understanding of its history, it's like a human being who has amnesia. Suppose you woke up tomorrow and you didn't know who you were. Can you, can you just imagine how, how empty your life would be and terrifying? So, but that's what will happen to us as a people if, if we, we actually aren't anchored in some sense of a national narrative, which is why he's a national treasure. Well, but the problem is with that, and I don't want to, that uh, I will go back to uh, Ernest Renan, a French historian of the late 19th century. He wrote, the historian is the enemy of the nation. What did Renan mean by that? What he meant was a lot of these narratives are myths. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's the historian, the killjoy historian yeah. comes yeah. along <laughs> and says, that's a myth, that's yeah. a myth. Yeah. And people often don't like that. They don't want yeah. their myths destroyed, yeah. but we, we have to present and not in a nasty or hostile way, but we have to present but good we, history, I not agree. just mythological history. I, I know you're not advocating mythological history, but there are people who resent when historians come up with new and sometimes less celebratory right. pictures of the past, but that's part of our obligation also, to make people understand the complexity of our history, not just a onward and upward narrative of greater and greater you yeah. know, fr freedom all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, over here. Hi, my name is Colin, and I had one question. Although a lot of the discussion we've had has been about uh, you know, the past and how those issues are still dealing in the present, a lot of that, um, where would you guys want to see maybe top three areas of modern political science research? Where would you want to see research turn a focus to handling the issues that we're seeing become so much more prevalent? And I'll take input from all of you as well. <laughs> Future research. <laughs> Well, Professor Mack, from what was announced, is doing some very important <laughs> research. If, you, uh, if he's writing a book about how race and political economy have changed since 1975, uh, that would be a great, co I, I look forward to that book, let's just put it that way, because um, you know, recent history is actually something that needs to be carefully looked at, as well as the history of 100 and 200 years ago. Yeah, and, and recent history comes with certain kinds of challenges, both yeah. methodological and sources and the fact that you're close to it. Mm -hmm. um, but it is true that most of our historical scholarship, you know, the, we, we've kind of taken in the 1970s now, sort of, um, and a little bit in the 1980s, um, and there are re good reasons for that. Um, so yeah, sure, I'd love to see more recent history although there are reasons why it's really difficult to do. Um, and I would say, um, and I'm very harsh you know, with most people, uh, but you know, I'm straight. This is great work that, that Eric has done, <laughs> and, it's a, and it's a body work. Here are two of the things that you've done that I think are, are really striking. Um, you, some, you write um, with the book Reconstruction, a synthetic history. You read all these smaller monographs and books and articles, and then you pull it together into a, a pretty big ep you know, epic story about the Reconstruction. That's a hard thing to do when we need that, because if we have just the micro studies, especially ordinary citizens, how, how to make sense of it. And then something like the story of freedom, or like Alex Kaiser's right to vote, most historians do not actually venture um, uh, broadly in time. They they have their period. You know, Eric is a you know a, a reconstruction. You know, a, a civil war, a, a mid mid nineteenth century person. Maybe you know from the Free Soilers to to Ulysses Grant or something like that. 
oh, but then he actually breaks out. And with a book like The Story of Freedom or something like that, you're trying to write a, about a 200-year history, a 250, and many, and, 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 and Hofstadter was amazing just in how broad he was. But that's a hard thing to do with an important thing. Kaiser is giving you an intergenerational account of the right to vote, or Linda Kerber about the rights of women you know, over time, or you know, a Mary Beth Norton, or Jill Lepore, or something. Um, it's very hard to do the intergenerational thing, but pretty important, um, to, um, and uh, uh, we do need that. Mm -hmm. uh, gentleman over here. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I have a, a question kind of a legal opinion here. Uh, we have a constitutional amendment keeping the presidency to two terms. Mm -hmm. And we may have a situation where someone might lose an election and call it a fraud, call it a uh, fixed election, uh, any number of reasons why they might reject their loss. What mechanism do we have to remove that person from office come January 20 of the following year if they refuse to relinquish the office. <laughs> yeah, is their vice president supporting them whom the, chief of uh, the chiefs of staff going to salute? Is the Supreme Court going to put up with any of this? Is the, the American citizenry going to put up with any of this? So, so I know you've heard, you know, we, we can all speculate. Um, I find these pretty fanciful scenarios, um, um, uh, uh, but we do live in um, very strange times. Somebody who I spoke to who was speculating in, or paranoid with paranoia about this. Um, the paranoid style in yeah, American exactly. politics said, is a great well, essay by out. Richard Now, Stott I, don't know if this is, I don't know if this is true or not, but said that the <laughs> Even though the president is the commander in chief of the armed forces, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. the District of Columbia police are not under <laughs> presidential authority. So you might have the District of Columbia police going into the White House to physically remove the person who is ensconced there. I'm not advocating this, I'm just saying someone mentioned it. <laughs> okay, so we, uh, we have time for one quick question and a quick answer. So. so uh, well, it's, it's 7.28. <laughs> Tempest fever. Uh, but but our, our panelists will be available uh, afterwards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's I, I'll, st to, I'll stay longer. Well, let this gentleman go what first. Do do? This one comes from someone watching online, so I want to get this one in. Um, mm -hmm. Why is the 14th Amendment the most important of Reconstruction, uh, and how, does it really, how would you say it relates to today's issues? Uh, can, can I do three? We, we have three people. I, I want to get all three questions on the Great. table. All right, let's get all on the table and then right. that's good. Okay, so the first one was 14th Amendment. You, you have to answer. <laughs> yes, I'd like to make a statement regarding you saying that Native Americans all became citizens in 1924. Uh, that's kind of not really the, the truth of that. They remain citizens of their nations. Yes. Um, and Dual citizenship. But they can now vote in well, uh, yes, presidential actually, elections. And it was actually the Buchanan administration in 57 that decided to take enormous amounts of land from the Native Americans, which was against a lot of the previous treaties that the, new, that the Natives had, um, which led to the Reconstruction. And the question again was asked in Boston was, is there no law that an Indian has that a white man has to respect? And that was part of the Boston Indian Citizenship Committee mm -hmm. and some very prominent people. Mm -hmm. So maybe you may answer those questions. Thank you. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, actually, let's get all three. So we got 14th Amendment, Native American Citizenship, and? Okay, mine's real fast. So firstly, I wanted to say thank you for this panel. Um, just to, I'm sure everybody knows that today is the 71st anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights of which Eleanor Roosevelt was chair, and she was a great mentor to President Kennedy, and I think she'd be rolling around in her grave today <laughs> what was going on. But my question is, Professor Amir, I'm a professor who is obligated to teach, but I'm also obligated to learn. So um, you mentioned um, the difference between um, re Republican congressmen and the Nixon impeachment, and them saying, well, he was a bad boy, 
but I'll support him anyway, or he wasn't, I mean, I'm not supporting him even though I'm a Republican. So probably the most disturbing thing that I've seen during this whole process is the Republican, like, all of them acting in the exact same way. Um, it's a rhetorical question as why you think this is happening. Great. Uh, but my question, my real question is, I, unless I'm incorrect, could they have a silent vote? And if they could, would the outcome be the same? Okay, so we have three questions. 14th Amendment, Native American citizenship, and impeachment, silent vote, partisanship. I'll <laughs> leave it to both of you to, to wrap up. Well, on Native American citizenship is really complicated, and I thank you for you know, bringing it up. And you know, Native Americans are dealt with by treaties sometimes, which is different from statute law and other things. So I do not claim to be an expert on that at all. I do believe, I believe that the 1924 law did declare all Native Americans born anywhere in the United States a citizen. Obviously, as you said, that didn't come with equality for Native Americans, nothing remotely like it, uh, even to this day, obviously, and many treaties have <laughs> not been uh, adhered to uh, clearly. Um, you know, the 14th Amendment, why is the 14th Amendment so important? I mean, it's, it's long, it deals with a whole bunch of issues, some of which are no longer on our agenda, like uh, that slave owners can't be compensated for the loss of their slave property, things like that. Uh, but it's the first section which, you know, really puts it, the word equal is not in the original Constitution except like where it says what happens if uh, uh, two candidates get an equal number of electoral votes. The concept of equality among Americans is put into the Constitution in the 14th Amendment. And that has enabled it in the 20th century to be the vehicle for the, as Akil mentioned before, all sorts of expansion of rights, including mostly for non-descendants uh, of slaves. Um, so it has, it has become the, the, the way in which individual Americans claim this notion of equality uh, when they feel they're being denied it. And that is, you know, has made the Constitution something fundamentally different than it was when it was originally written with slavery as uh, part of it. Um, <clears throat> on the 14th Amendment, um, uh, here are two words in it that, uh, and they're painful words for, you to, uh, for us to acknowledge, but we need to. Um, it's this from section two, excluding Indians. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's in the 14th Amendment section two um, on um, the, 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 the proper um, apportionment basis. So that's part of our history. Mm -hmm. I champion Lincoln. I think he's great in all sorts of ways, but from the Native American perspective, oh, it's a lot more complicated. Much more complicated. Um, and Reconstruction ends in the South in part so that the army can be moved out to the west. That's, you know, west from Appomattox and Heather Cox Richardson and other people's work. And Eric is nodding as if he thinks that that's yeah, a plausible that's right. story. Fourteenth Amendment, just to recap, is about several key things. Birthright citizenship, racial, and not just racial, but all sorts of other equality because it doesn't say race. I would say sex equality, sexual orientation equality, religious equality, birth equality. We're all born equal. We're all born equal, male or female, black or white, a, a, a Jew or Gentile, gay or straight, in wedlock or out of wedlock. So equality um, and birthright citizenship and fundamental rights that apply against states as well as and localities as well as the federal government, what lawyers call incorporation of the Bill of Rights against the states and sweeping federal power to enforce everything. Those are big, big things. We move from uh, First Amendment says Congress shall make no law and the Tenth Amendment to Congress shall have power, Congress shall have power, Congress shall have power, and the Fourteenth Amendment is very big. So that's the Fourteenth Amendment and its centrality. Oh, you're so, it's so interesting, this idea. Um, suppose actually we had secret ballots. How many people would still, uh, in Congress, ab about Trump. Would they say the same things publicly? Uh, um, would they actually vote uh, secretly um, because they're afraid of their bases? It doesn't say um, in the Constitution what kind of ballot. So they each have, right? each house, you know, is um, um, uh, allowed. There are some rules actually about um, uh, twenty percent can demand actually right. an open vote on, on on various things. But but um, I want to take you finally back to the Fourteenth Amendment because yeah, the Republicans are all lockstep. But I 
have to be honest with you. So are the Democrats. I'm a Democrat, okay? The Republicans were basically in lockstep on the Clinton matter, um, but so were the Democrats. It's symmetric, and when people can't see that, it's just like a mathematical point, okay? This is a problem in our society when no one is actually seeing the other side, okay? We're as tribal in some ways as they are, <laughs> and, um, and, and you ask me why, Here's one of the reasons why, because of primaries, and you gotta worry about your base, 80% of congressional districts are left-wing Democrat or right-wing Republican, and their people are more worried about being primaried from the base than they are about a general election in, in the middle, and, um, and, 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 um, and, and people, Walter Cronkite used to tell us all that's the way it was, but we were all watching Walter Cronkite. That's what those amazing TV exhibits are downstairs. Today, we're getting different information flows, and people who watch Fox are experiencing a different world, because you can pick your media, than people who watch MSNBC. Here's what I do want to tell you finally. We've been here at least once before, and he's the world's expert on it. <laughs> every single Democrat votes against, in Congress, every single one, lockstep, votes against the 14th Amendment. Every single Republican except one votes for this. So the Liberal Party, every single person except one votes for this thing. And the one was named, I think, Joe Lieberman. No, 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 I'm getting confused. <laughs> but but ev every, so, so we had complete partisan voting in the 1860s. We didn't in the 1960s. We had conservative Democrats and liberal Rockefeller Republicans. So we are going back in some ways to the 1860s. We've been there, it didn't, and, and that was a, a really fraught time in, in, in America, but we're seeing, I have to be honest with you, I'm a Democrat. I voted against the guy. I'm gonna vote against him, you know, this time, you know, with extreme enthusiasm. <laughs> um, but I have to say, oh, they're lockstep, but so are my guys. Okay. Um, thank you for coming. Thank, thank our parents. Okay. Thank you, Akio. And they'll be signing books afterwards. Okay. Thank you for coming. Oh.